Right, everyone. Um, we'll be very shortly starting the uh, poster session and demo session. Uh, we'll, um, I'll remind again all uh, presenters that these will be three minutes to showcase your submission. And uh, if Rui Varandas is here, I'd ask him to um, turn on his camera and start presenting system architecture proposal for distance learning applications. If you please, Rui Varandas. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm here to talk about system architecture proposal for distance learning applications. And first of all, I will talk a little bit about learning, which involves multiple processes and depends on the attention levels as well as engagement and the emotional state of learners. Uh, usually the way to assess these aspects is analogical and limited in time. For example, it is very common to apply uh, questionnaires such as the NASA TLDX, which assesses the state of a person in, the, in a given moment, but it cannot be applied in real time and may be subject, subjective to each individual. Uh, on the other hand, bias signals have been applied in brain-computer interfaces and telemedicine and provide an objective way to assess the state of a person without the need for the inputs of that person. So it does not depend uh, on the opinion of each individual. These signals can also be acquired in real time, allowing for a continuous measurement of different variables. Additional sources of behavioral data can be identified when we consider the interaction with the computer. For example, mouse movements, as well as keyboard strokes, have been linked to effective states when people interacted with the e-learning platforms. Uh, moreover, when combined with bias signals, it was demonstrated that it was possible to assess personality traits. So e-learning could greatly, greatly benefit with these sources of data in the sense that they could assist in the, in the assessment of learner states over the internet. Uh, thus, we propose the development of a pedagogical recommendation system that integrates an uh, adaptation engine that is capable to update the learning content in, in real time, given the learner's cognitive and affective states using biosignals, such as EEG and FNIRS, and also human-computer interaction variables. Thus, the system will enable personalized learning based on the preferences of each learner and on, and on their states in each moment. For example, if the content is too easy, the learner might feel uh, bored. And if we are able to detect that state, we will be able to increase the difficulty level to keep the learner in the state of flow or engaged. Uh, the proposed system will be composed of three modules here in the center, uh, the student, the knowledge, and the recommendation module. The student module comprises all data related to learners, namely the bias signals, the human computer interaction data, and also the overview data. While bias signals and human computer interaction are updated in real time, overview data is collected at the beginning to assess the background knowledge, preferences, and objectives of each learner, allowing to tailor the experience from the beginning. Uh, artificial intelligence techniques will be applied to extract information about the learner state from these data sources. Then the knowledge uh, module focuses on the learning standards definition and educational content creation. The learning standards will define the overall content of the developed courses and will be adaptable for different learners. Finally, the, the recommendation module consists in the development of the pedagogical recommendation system, which will integrate the data from the other two modules. The adaptation will be assisted by the results of the cognitive and effective, effective state assessment. This information will then be used to find the most appropriate adaptation of the content for learning optimization. So in conclusion, we, we propose the uh, new learning system architecture to overcome one of the hindrances in distance learning applications, which is the monitoring and under, understanding of the learner states in real time. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you. If we could uh, move along then. Um, if you could look then at the poster for a multiplayer video game to promote ecological awareness and prevent social alienation. I believe Professor Morato is here. It's going to be my colleague, João Moraes, to present. Uh, João Moraes, certainly. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings. Let me just share my, my screen. Okay. Everyone's seeing? Yes. The poster? Okay. 
So again, greetings everyone. I'm Jean Moraes. I'm going to be presenting the poster Rouage, a multiplayer competitive video game design around two important matters, ecological awareness and social alienation. Um, around campus here at our university, we can normally observe students sitting next to each other with their heads down using their smartphones. Frequently, groups of colleagues gather around during intervals and keep their eyes focused on the phone screen uh, the entire time. This type of behavior um, has been described as alone together and arises with technology dependency, fear of missing out and other possible issues. Our goal was to build a game that could be played in those contexts of social alienation, but that at the same time promoted social interactions um, um, sorry, social interactions um, and gaming sessions, either for players as well as for spectators. We aim the design of the game to cover a social cause that could be that could be fit in the game rules. We decided to emulate a pre-technology scenario where people gather around. We decided that a good match would be horse racing games that are um, usually uh, very common. Uh, at carnivals, at least here at our hometown, in some fairs that we uh, have usually um, uh, all the years. They promote a socially active environment with players and spectators. Um, the players play um, a simple game in their spot in which the points that the player scores are um, translated into movements of usually a horse that is physically present in the game tent. The better the score, the more the horse's movies and the first horse to cross the finish line determines, determines the winner. We designed our game with a social screen where the horse races occurs and the mini game is played on the player's phone. To play, a person first installs the game uh, on their phone and connects to the social screen using a code shown on a pre-game phase. Then, during the game, the players play the mini game competitively with each other. For the game team, we focus the issue of ecological awareness. Regarding the mini game, we develop a, a paper toss game and adapt it to have three se separate recycled containers, uh, card, glass, and plastic metal containers. The player must gather and toss items to the correspondent container. With this focus on cleaning the sea pollution, we changed the social screen representing a race from horses to dolphins. The mini game prototype was developed in Unity and is currently compatible with Android phones. Social screen is a separate application, which was also developed in Unity and currently running on Windows PC. The communication between the game and the social screen uses a Node.js server that manages the gaming session and the communication is done using JSON um, in the server. Data is also stored in a MySQL database. Every time uh, a new game is started, as I said before, at the social screen is a Unicode is generated and players can join, ensuring that they connect to that uh, unique social screen. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the system was not yet tested in the field. However, uh, it has been tested in smaller in a smaller context as a family game, and uh, initial player feedback has been gathered. This should be considered in a further prototype where we also intend to improve the visuals of the game to provide a more compelling and captivating game experience. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Joao. See you next time. Right. Let's move on then. Uh, presentation regarding EcoPoly, a game to raise environmental awareness. Not that's, sure who's. That, that, that's going to be me. All right, Professor Morat. Let me just share the, the screen. Certainly. Well, you are all seeing that, right? I so I'm Forst Morat. I'm here to present now Echo, the project Echo Poly. It's a, it's a game that's been developed by our undergraduate students. It's a strategy game around the topic of uh, ecological awareness. So there are several games with this with this topic. This is not new, but normally those games focus to, uh, makes the player to be 
to be eco-friendly. They are points, achievements, and all the types of mechanics to reward the player for, for being eco-friendly. And we wanted to present a darker picture about this problem and to have a more realistic representation of this. So I think this is the main aspect that differs this game from, from others. And the main premises are that being eco-friendly is frustrating, is hard-working, time-consuming, expensive, and without global commitment, we can feel that it's worthless. So, so the game designed the, a set of rules where we try to, to represent this. So we have a, a game board in with a world map like like risk and we play the role of business uh, businessman just like in in monopoly for instance where we try to to be the wealthiest player in the turns the players can build industries they can also act towards the the regional authorities to make them allow or restrict the existence of pollutant buildings and they can also perform cleaning activities in regions uh, what happens is that regarding in industry, using polluted buildings is always cheaper, is always better for the players, and pre performing cleaning activities in the regions don't provide any reward at all. For so for the player, it's just a waste of an action. So with this with this set of rules, probably no one no one is going to to be eco friendly in the games. But there's a small problem with that: that when regions get polluted, po po polluted and the pollution spreads among the regions and if the planet gets too polluted then the world is destroyed and, and and it's game over for all the players so the game works around this this kind of mind games with these conflicts of individual and global goals that the player have to have to deal and have to manage so currently we have this this prototype that we we have presented and we, we have applied some initial usability tests, some rule balancing. It now needs some polishing. To, we need to upgrade the, the design parts of the game. And we believe that in, it, it's interesting to, to study the, the evolution of emotions during gameplay because we are forcing some kind of frustration to the player. We want to understand how this, how this emotion is, is managed by the players through the, through the gameplay. So about this project, it's all... I will present the next one also, so All right. maybe Thank I can you. I can Thank go in, in yeah, a road directly, in. directly, sure. So the, the other one is Echo Arcade. It's also another project developed by one of our undergraduate students. It's uh, it's uh, a project also focused on on the on the environmental issues, and our goal is to to promote the recycling of of plastic bottle caps. So this is something that in Portugal we have seen some initiatives during the, the 21st century, we still have places in, in offices, schools, etc. We have the, the large bottles that we can we can collect the the bottle caps and then send them to institutions to exchange them by by effective money. So we wanted to create something that could reward the this type of behavior of gathering this this cap. So we decided to implement uh, an arcade machine that instead of coins it uses uh, the bottle caps. So currently we have this prototype and now the caps are placed in a slot and then they are analyzed by a set of sensors that are placed uh, within the structure and the, those sensors are connected to, uh, to an Arduino board and those, those sensors feed uh, an artificial neural network that analyzes the, the material and that, uh, that network can be trained to identify the, if the object is indeed a, a plastic bottle cap. Well, being positive, I I believe that normally the people were not going to to go there to the machine just to 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 put any all types of objects just to just to vandalize the machine or just to play a couple of minutes of a game. I, probably that would not happen a lot, but this works. But this recognition system also works as a test for for further improve, improvements that we want to to apply to this to this project for instance to recognize another other types of objects such as bottles uh, cans etc in order to to have a, a, a more complete gathering mechanism right now we have this structure it needs to be perfected it needs to to have uh, an improvement within its 3d structure with with 3d printed parts we have to adjust the recognition system and especially we need to put this machine on, on campus in order to test it to, to see what's the, the effective uh, reaction and if we can indeed 
motivate the the gathering of these these bottle caps and this is this is the end of this presentation right uh thank you professor morato um a very clear interesting and brisk presentation we should move on okay. then to uh user experience usability and engageability study in a serious game by afonso Lage and andresa who i believe are present here hi afonso hello can ev can everyone hear me yes and see the the poster as well okay perfect so i'm gonna start okay hello everyone my name is afonso Lage, and I'm here to present my and my colleagues' project, Usability and Engageability in a Serious Game. This project was assigned to us in our user experience subject in, your, in our video games degree at Lusofna. So let's begin. Basically, uh, our professors gave us a demo of the game Outer Worldly Math, and they asked us to conduct some tests regarding the player's experience. So we did just that. We gathered some participants, we did some playtest sessions, and we collected data regarding usability and engageability. To achieve this, we recorded the playtest sessions. We had the Google Forms document with some questions for our participants to answer. And we had some documents we, that we filled out regarding the, the player's answers and overall performance. Uh, with this, we actually got some rather interesting results. We began by splitting the concept of engagement into five categories, challenge, interest, purpose, control and immersion, and we rated them from zero to five. By doing this, we actually discovered that the overall level of engagement was pretty average and that the only positive categories were challenge and interest, while control, purpose and immersion left much to be desired. However, not everything is bad. Uh, most of our participants completed the game without skipping any puzzle, which is something pretty good. Of course, some of them got a little bit lost along the way. It's normal, but overall, it was a pretty positive experience. Now, what did we learn? We learned that the game doesn't give the players a feeling of purpose and context for their actions. However, we think that this is the demo's fault and not the game's fault. The demo has a set path that the players have to complete in order to test everything. And due to time constraints, we can't give them a full-blown narrative for them to follow. So. In the full game, uh, they will have that support. They will have that context for their actions. So we don't think that it will be a problem right now. However, we al also found some problems regarding tutorials. They need a lot of work. Our participants repeated the tutorials at least once in certain challenges. And this is worrying because the average participant age is 20 years old, while the target audience for this game is 10-year-old children. We strongly recommend that the developers repeat these tests with participants with the same age as the target audience. And that's basically all I have to say. Uh, I just want to thank you for your time and for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. During the Q&A, uh, thank you, Alphonse. That was a very effective, well-prepared presentation. Thank you. Very fluent. Now, if we could move on. Uh, Ogrelier, development of an application to promote oral language skills in children entering primary school with Fabio Dias. Oral language, uh, it includes a lot of different uh, language domains. It goes from lexical, synthetical, and phonological. Uh, and given its wide range, uh, it's associated with uh, academic success, with uh, communication, and it has a lot of implications in later down in life. Uh, so normally the assessment is very tedious for the children. It involves a lot of asking questions and they aren't able to get a, a straight answer. Uh, and it becomes increasingly difficult because it varies a lot of the, between the, the language groups. The intervention uh, is normally focused on uh, reading tasks, which can be done at school or with parents at home. Uh, but it can't only focus on the reading, it needs to go beyond, it needs to go into the asking questions, answering, training the pronunciation and so forth. So this is actually where digital interventions uh, come in. So Ogreler, for example, uh, the objective is to place the child not as a passive answering machine, but also to role play as a teacher. So they will train their knowledge, they will be assessed in what they already know. And through different kinds of activities, the objective is to try to stimulate uh, different or uh, different language domains from a receptive to an expressive level. 
the game was done using Unity and other speech, uh, which as a voice recognition isn't perfect. So the first main role is going to try to see with normative population from age six to seven to check uh, how good the speech recognition is working. Probably the best approach is going to create a local library. Uh, and right now I'm still in open dialogue with first grade teachers to assess the exercises that have been done, namely the naming task, the morphosynthetic reconstruction, and also the understanding of context structures. So here the, there's only image examples, but it's normally about uh, trying to figure out which image it is, answering back, trying to figure out the pronunciation, trying to read the story, answering questions based on that story, and so forth. So if you have any questions, please uh, bring in them later to me. This is still a very early project. I hope it still can mature a bit more. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, moving on to the uh, to the space adventure Defend the Planet demo. I think Fernando Suarez will be presenting. Yes? Yeah. It's yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Just give Hi. me a second. No problem. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Fernando Suarez. I'm a game developer and researcher from Secant, and I'm the co-founder of Planet Files Studios. Uh, I was a lead developer uh, on project GBL for Dev, and I was in charge of leading the implementation and managing the development team of two other programmers. And also, uh, I was there to bridge the gap between the game designer and the researchers. Um, so I, I made sure uh, their vision was implemented on time and correctly. Um, I also helped designing uh, some of the game user research uh, and uh, user experience testing. And I'm going to uh, give a really short overview of our game uh, that took about uh, 13 people in the core team and two years to complete. Um, it's a space adventure defend the planet uh, is a research based game. It's a single player role playing and puzzle game. It uses third person perspective with uh, isometric view. Uh, it puts the player in control of the commander, a character in charge of building a space base on another planet while defending against some threats as pe pesky space par pirates. Um, the player is motivated to solve mathematical challenge in order to obtain various rewards and the mathematic knowledge becomes the tool the player uses to solve the puzzles uh, as a means to an end, rather than the end itself. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, traditional educational games uh, make uh, learning and uh, the pedagogy as the main focus. We kind of um, put fun and pedagogy on, on a balance and said uh, that our game needs to be fun first and by being fun we shall teach them uh, about uh, the mathematic uh, knowledge. Uh, to progress in the, the, the game the player needs to collect resources to build uh, various parts of the base and, uh, and he, needs, in, he learns to manage their resources uh, because for each level of the base, uh, the resources needed uh, are exponentially um, higher, but uh, and the mathematical challenges in itself get harder, but the rewards also increase. So they are uh, so they need to kind of manage that. Do I do I make my mathematical challenge harder? Uh, and gain more resources, or I keep the mathematical challenge uh, easier and gain less resources. So uh, th they kind of place their progression that way. Uh, also, uh, we have the fun element. Uh, the pirates from time to time attack the base and the player needs to construct ships with that resources to fight them. Um, so the meta goal is to defeat uh, the pirates and uh, save the base, the planet. Um, 
I'm just going to skip this. So our first challenge is a refinery, it's addition and subtraction. Uh, our second challenge is multiplication and division and the inverse, multi the inverse process of multiplication and division. Our third challenge is algorithmic thinking and translations and rotations. And our fourth challenge is about the Cartesian coordinate system, Tangram, um, and about uh, doing points on a coordinate and uh, tracing um, segments. Uh, during our, we have two main innovations. It's uh, DHH first design uh, and uh, our workflow. Uh, that was based on the design play and experience framework, but we kind of uh, improved on that and changed it a lot. So at the end, it was uh, a bit different. We will probably publish about this more in the future. So I'll just skip this. Um, our second most um, innovation, it's uh, DHH first design. Uh, we had a really careful analysis of their habits uh, with media and how they consume media and how they interact with media. Uh, we kind of had to forego all, all of our knowledge regarding usability and experience because as we found, they really interact in, this, in a different way. So we, we had to kind of create uh, new rules and apply them to to our interface and uh, our experience and how we present that information and how we teach how to play the game. Uh, so thank you. Uh, here uh, you can see our contact information. Feel free to ask us questions. Uh, I'm available anytime. Sure. Or you, you. Can, you can post it on the chat too. That might sure. be helpful. Now, um, I would like to let's move on to our final demo, who will have three to four minutes to present. Uh, so the demo for Would You Denounce Your Neighbor, representing 1980s Hungarian society through a walking simulator. Uh, and Agnes Karolina Bach, I'm sorry if I no, mispronounced that. Uh, if, you, if you'd care to start, please. Yes, thank you very much. It's very nice to be here and um, yes, we would uh, like to present briefly also on the behalf of Pendegu Satmari, our uh, video game walking simulator project that we developed in 2020, 2021 in a very short time. Uh, so the question, uh, it's, it's a rhetorical question, would you denounce your neighbor? Because the actual title of the, of the game was 1986 and I will tell you briefly soon why it was this the title, but first, uh, what was the goal of this game? The goal of this game what, was to present that uh, actually what led to the system change in uh, 1989 in Hungary. What happened there on the individual level? How can we present that? What was the people's motivation when they actually chose or they were directing themselves to actually make a political change or to let it happen to have a political change? The message of the game was, first of all, it's... Um, that the pathway, the, this procedure, when the system change happened in 1989, uh, it was not a black and white process. There, there were many nuances that we might forget today or might be not contextualize today. And we also have to understand, as I said before, the personal motivation behind that. Like there were always people who were uh, actually doing this change. The target audience of the game was like uh, between 14 and 80 years old youngsters and school teachers who are mainly teaching history. And uh, we were commissioned to create this game mainly with the aim that they can actually present this during the classes and uh, let them talk about the system change. Because the problem in the Hungarian schools is usually they don't, the, uh, in the rhythm in the curricula, they don't arrive there to actually uh, talk about the system change in 1986, 1989, because usually they end up uh, in the mid 1950s. 
But what were the challenges when we were creating this game? And it's not a coincidence that my presentation is black and white, because this is like, we don't want to have it as black and white. So the first question was how to present a complex historical happening in, in, a, in a short time and in a game, and what to do uh, with it, and how to present it in a first person narrative. The second challenge was how to engage this target audience. As we might know, these are teenagers. I mean, we over teenagers. We know that it's very, very hard to actually engage them because their uh, time span that they spend with the attention is very, very short. Uh, the other one, because uh, we were commissioned by the Open Society Archive, uh, Vera and Donald Lincoln here in Budapest, and they are an archive. And for them, it was very important that the historical data that we present is very accurate. The other one was, uh, I didn't or I didn't clearly state it, but we actually had very little time around uh, three or four months to develop a 3D first person game. And uh, this was actually a very, very, very fast iteration. And uh, the other one, and why this is referring why it was uh, the title 1986, because we were looking for what are the possible uh, historical references that this age, the, the, these youngsters might know. And the 1986 was uh, when actually the Chernobyl happened and they most probably watched the Chernobyl uh, uh, series. So we could actually make a lot of references. And so to not to be so boring in the last couple of uh, seconds in my presentation, uh, what we were trying to do is also to include actual real footage into the video game. So here you can say, Jan, Jan, see Janos Kadar, who was the main leading figure of the Guyash communism as we know it in Hung Hungary. So we actually included also footage which the player could watch. And uh, we were also paying extra to, uh, attention to the environmental storytelling elements. So these are actually existing uh, music band posters from that age in Hungary, but you could actually, as a player, you could watch it. And uh, how we actually presented uh, this complex narrative is that we, uh, the player can engage in the, for, it's, it's a first person, uh, first person uh, 3D game, and you can, you can actually be two characters. One is a niece, a uh, young sociology student, Judith, and the other one is his uh, uncle, George, who's a, uh, who's a journalist, and the journalist is more in favor to this system, like very plainly said, and Judith is fighting against the system. And they are also neighbors. And the big question is whether at the end, when you also played the character of Judith, and when you also played the character of George, would you denounce your uh, niece because she's fighting the system or not? And very briefly about the team, as I mentioned, the game was commissioned by the Vera and Donald Blinken Open Society Archive, and they were commissioned by the Hung uh, US Embassy in Budapest. And uh, the team was uh, composed by Bendegu Satmari. He was the art director, generalist, and the concept director. Uh, we had uh, also a very hardworking uh, Unity developer. Uh, we worked together with Dorka Kovac. She's also a UX designer and narrative designer, and I was coordinating. And also on the behalf of the Archive, we were working almost on a daily basis with historians who were fact checking, suggesting us material, rechecking the environmental storytelling elements. And it, we realized that it was actually a very, very, very challenging but very fruitful work. So, thank you very much for your attention. And I will post our email address into the chat. Okay. Uh, thank you, Agnes. Uh, so, now we can start, I believe, the Q&A session for the next few minutes. Uh, we already have a question uh, by Carla Souza. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if there's anybody else. Carla, please go ahead. Yeah, I have actually lots of questions, but I don't want to bore you that much. So I will start for the first one. Um, before the question, I would like to really uh, congratulate Afonso and Andrea for being here. Afonso and Andrea are undergraduate students, so it takes uh, lots of courage uh, to be in, in such a conference um, with your professors. So for that, you know, a big a big round of applause for them. My question is is basically for them, and it's, it's basically uh, what have you learned not about that game, not about to uh, how to implement user experience testing, but you know, in a broader manner. What do you think you have gained from this experience? Afonso? Andre? Oh, hi, sorry. My internet was having a few problems. Um, 
Uh, I think we we learned the other side of making games, the, the part of testing and what goes behind that process. We already knew a little bit from game design, the, our subject, but this actually shed a new light on the subject. And uh, uh, I discovered that I actually like doing it. It's actually a fun process. It would be f better if we weren't on COVID times, but it is what it is, nothing to do. But uh, it, I actually, yes, I just learned about the process and I think it, it, uh, it was a pretty positive experience. I think Andre is here to my question also. <laughs> Andre. Uh, yes, he's he's informing us he doesn't have a, a mic and cam set up. But oh yeah, that makes sense. He's, he's one hundred percent behind. Um, if nobody has any questions right now, I, I have a few of my own uh, for uh, Professor Morato. If that's all right. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm seeing a lot of, this is just sort of commentary and just bouncing ideas off you. Uh, you said you had a neural network actually analyzing the bottle caps to determine whether or not they were plastic. Yes. That, that raises some very tantalizing possibilities for future work, like you could modify the design of the game live or change the game based on what material is inserted in the machine. So people could play a game based on what they send out to recycle. I'm not sure if that's even a possibility. Yes, we haven't we, we haven't thought about that, but that's possible. Yes, now we are just considering if something entered there, it's identified as a, a coin, a, a simple unity. But that's that's really possible. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. It, it just it just seemed to me like a, a sort of interesting possibility. Like you could have a modular game on the arcade machine, and in it would somehow reflect the person's recycling habits, or maybe even encourage the person to recycle more or less. You could have bonuses. Also, I found it interesting in the uh, game where you you are a business tycoon. The, the penalty or the 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 harm from from being environmentally unfriendly it comes all at once yes all at once and for all the players all yeah it's simultaneously but it, it could be like i don't know degrading like the more pollution you have the less healthy the workforce is and then in, in the long term it takes away money so you can make a sort of more diffuse dilemma i don't know i'm just yes, so bouncing not, not bouncing being so energy. cruel uh, just as just at once yeah, it's uh, well, it depends on the definition of cruelty. I also found interesting one thing that um, that Fernando pointed out, uh, basically this sort of idea that you want to get away from instrumental outcomes in GBL. I wasn't able to quite tell from your demonstration. Uh, those challenges, you showed us those sort of curricular challenges, they appear in a sort of fixed order. Or are they triggered by by player resource management? I didn't quite understand. Yeah, they, they appeared in uh, they appear in a fixed order, uh, the first level uh, of each challenge. Uh, but then uh, the second and third level, uh, the players really need to upgrade the bases as they as they want. Okay, so you have an unlock an unlock mechanic for these challenges then. Yeah. yeah. It's emergent in space. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm not sure if anybody has any further questions, for instance, regarding Uberware or. Yes, I have some. Uh, oh, sorry. Mikael also. Oh, Mikael and Carla, sorry, I wasn't. So, you want Carla? Me? Yeah, I, I, can, I can go. I have actually two, two more questions. Um, sorry if you're uh, listening to me uh, too, ma too many times today, but, but I have a question for, for Fabio. Um, is your your project is, is very interesting uh, because it um, it brings together two sides of uh, a coin that seem to be very very far sometimes the questions of fan fantasy you know fantasy which is a, a, a very important element in games and also the question of standardization that is a very uh, important element in psychometry 
Um, so my my question is again very utopic and, and very broad, but it's how, how do you think fantasy can enhance standardized processes um, in in if evaluating people by psychological instruments? Okay, so my main objective here, uh, I had the opportunity while I was doing my bachelor at TISPA. Uh, some of my professors, they were both psychologists and also speech therapists. So we went a lot to the um, to children's houses, to schools and so forth, and we actually applied this one, which is the initial thing. So this is like the standard book in Portugal for the evaluation of the oral language. And it's really, really hard for the children to do it. So in my perspective, as if we can uh, deviate from the main goal of just asking questions, if we can make the, ch the children understand it as not as it was like kind of an interrogation process, but something that we're actually having fun doing. It. I think it, the, we can give much better results also. So yeah, yeah, I think it's one part of the whole strategy. We'll see how it works. Yeah, definitely, because uh, we really need to to start using such features to enhance these processes, namely with, with children, which are a very difficult population to engage in psychological assessments. Um, also, I have, and, and sorry, once again, I have another question for, for Agnes. Um, I, I found very interesting because you are trying to, to tell a story to, through a framework of complexity that we already um, discussed today, which is the, probably, I, I would read to say, the best way to teach through games. But you also are, are giving us two sides of the same story. So my question is very concrete. Uh, when you, um, you have the option, as I understood, to, to choose two different characters that are, as I said, two opposite sides of, of the same story. So how does this affect gameplay, if, if this does affect gameplay? Uh, thank you for the question. It's actually a, a very relevant that we were also thinking uh, a very long time, given in the very short time. Uh, because it's a walking simulator, we made that design choice that actually you do, you cannot choose. You have to go through by chapter by chapter, uh, through both of the uh, protagonist uh, uh, perspective. So first you start with Judith, when you have to, when you realize where you are, then you realize that, hmm, everything what I do is basically against the system and they were very tricky and uh, uh, very, uh, uh, not very good things happening to you. You were beaten on a bridge and then you are suddenly in a headquarter of, a, of an editorial and then, your wife is there and she's asking like, how do we get a bigger house? And then you start to see this contrast more and more like by chapter by chapter, you are jumping from one character to the other one. And uh, basically this was the only way how in this format we could address complexity. Uh, but now we are working more, it's more a branching narrative story where uh, we are working now on another historical game where you actually have the branching narrative uh, structure is go what's going to help us to be more, uh, to represent this complexity more. So, yes. Uh, on the other hand, we have, a, uh, I'm also part of a big cost action, which is like interactive digital narratives for complexity representation. So actually, if those who are interested in this, I this is the advertisement place, I would really highly suggest to check out. We are also going to make a, an open encyclopedia about concepts regarding uh, complexity representation in interactive digital narratives. So it's uh, it's actually it's a very uh, highly discussed subject. So so on that you're you're already going to go with emergent narratives and more granular narratives. Yes 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 yes. And and hopefully you'll have more than four months to create a three D first person. Game yes now that's, now that's we have terrifying. nine. Months. <laughs> That's still that's still not very much time. <laughs> Thank you, but it's it's uh, actually it's also very much rewarding to work with historians and then you to think like how much something can be a documentary and when can it go into fiction? Because here we didn't really have space to go into fiction, and now we have a little bit more. So thank you for the question. Um, Mikaela, do you yes, have a question? Finally. Sorry. Um, no, no problem uh, at all. So I don't know if Riverandes is still in here. 
Yes. yes. Thank you, Hui. So um, I was wondering because we are now we have a playful interaction design lab in here, and it, I was uh, I was thinking that is really interesting your your work uh, regarding education, and uh, so we are working more in effective computing. So I, I was wondering uh, which biosignals you are using in order to see if the the the, the part participant is uh, is bored, is frustrated. Can you tell a little more about your biosignals? what you are going to use or what you think you are using and if it's working, of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, we are using a lot of sensors in this stage. Mm -hmm. We are still searching for the best combination, but we started by using the EEG, the electroencephalogram, the mm -hmm. electrocardiogram, uh, electrodermal activity, uh, respiration band, uh, an acceler accelerometer for the posture, and also the functional near infrared spectroscopy uh, sensors. These are all modular and really simple. For example, the EEG is, is only two channels instead of the, the headset that is usually applied. And we are still working on, on finding the best uh, combination of sensors. We already have um, an acquisition uh, procedure to, to acquire data from, from different individuals. Uh, the results are still in an early stage because we had some issues with the acquisitions. But it seems that, for example, the best results have been achieved with the um, DAG, the ECG, and also the accelerometer. So the FNIRS was one of the main um, sensors that we were expecting to have good results, but it seems that they were not, uh, basically because the positioning was probably not the best. But uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we are applying some machine learning techniques and extracting mm -hmm. some relevant features from all these sensors. I was wondering, so you are going to, you, you think to use all of them? So the participant is going to have the FNIRS, as you said, is, 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 is mm -hmm. probably you are not going to use anymore. But uh, so you put everything together and you correlate the, the, the signals in order to understand what is the, the emotion for the participant. Is that right? If I understood correctly. Yes. We are trying to find the best combination in order to reduce this, the number of sensors because there is a yeah, lot it's of a lot of, As you said, it's a lot of them. Yeah. We're going to put uh, the ADA and uh, the ADA and uh, everything yeah. like that. Okay, so I'm really excited to see the, the end of your PhD in order to understand which which uh, biosensor is going to use, is going to be perfect to use in this in this type of uh, of activities. Okay, for me, thank you so much. Louis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today. Thank you for the question. Um, we still have two minutes left on the Q and A. I'm not sure if anybody would like to chime in with. Some more impressions, comments, questions. So can I use a little more? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So Hui, sorry, sorry to, to because I'm really interested in this work. So you already using uh, some participants, right? You you have a, a, a group control already, or just in, in the testing phase in this right moment. We're still in the testing phase. We will probably adapt the, the acquisition procedure because mm -hmm. of the, the results. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.